Hi, my name is Suzanne Jabor. I'm a grief educator and coach, and I'm so excited to have a conversation with Pearl today. Hey, everybody, this is Pearl Sharenzo with Women's Successful Living and the podcaster owner here of Conversations with Pearl. And today I'm excited to have um, an, a very special guest and we have we have some things in common. If you follow our podcast, you'll, you'll start to understand as you listen. But today I have Susan Jabora on and she's a grieving mom who has found meaning in her loss through opening up conversations about grief, how it really works and how we can support people experience it. She works with organizations and businesses to build skills and protocols to support people who are grieving at work. She also works with grievers to help find their own grief path, which is so important. We all, our paths are always different. And she also works with grievers to uh, not only with their grief path, but she also is a speaker to share her story and help normalize grief as a healthy response to losses, big and small. She's a certified grief educator, transformational coach, and workshop leader. And I'm so excited to have you on today to talk about this subject. And uh, welcome to the show, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And, you know, I'm just going to say before we get started, if you're listening to the show and you've recently lost somebody and or a child, um, just know that you might be triggered with some, some of the conversations we have. And if you want to reach out to us, we will put in the show notes how to reach out to Suzanne or myself. But just know that you're we're trying to create a safe space and open conversation about grief because sometimes we don't know what to say to others. And I think, Suzanne, the work you're doing is so powerful. And people like you have helped me through my grief path as well. So thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you. Yeah, it's so important that I love that you give that sort of activation warning. Like this is for some going to be a difficult conversation. I always hope, you know, my goal is to always have a conversation about grief that makes people want to lean in and not run away screaming. Right. So, yeah. You know, it's, you know, we'll do our very best. But if you're a grieving parent, especially, or you're early in your grief process, um, I know I'm just over three years out. And sometimes when I talk about, you know, how grief works, it sounds really kind of clinical. And I, and I want people to understand that you and I both have walked this walk. You know, yeah. we're both bereaved moms of beautiful, you know, just launching brilliant boys. And um, and so we get what those early days are like. And, you know, part of what I want people to understand is that those early days don't last forever. And I know it feels like it because it sure felt like it for me, yeah. but they don't. And the magic is in figuring out how do you create a path forward? How do you yeah. move on? Not And move on is such an awful word. I don't even like to use it. I'm surprised it came out of my mouth because I've never used that because that has the implication that you're going to leave your person behind. And I'm all about moving with, like I'm right. building a life with Ben. Ben is still here. He's still part of my life. I still talk to him all the time. I know you talk to your son too. You know, they're still very present in our lives. And I think that, especially for a grieving parent, and I suspect for people who've lost a longtime spouse, it's similar. Someone who's that embedded in your life, in your everyday life, you have to find a way to carry them with you. Right. Because otherwise nothing makes sense. So if you're in those very earliest days, please know we get it. We're here to help you see that there's a way to just keep breathing and taking baby steps and finding your way. Yeah. And I so th- I think it's so, so important. I'm glad you you reminded us that because also too, it's really important for our self-care, which we talk a lot about here is mm-hmm. to understand, like you said. I feel like in my life, there was the before Matthew passed and now after, right? And I literally can tell you, I was on a beach the day, the night, the, actually the night of that he passed, like literally that afternoon, had a conversation on the way home after sunset with him, and then talked to him a little bit after midnight. And it's like, literally like there's a day, there's the day before and then the after. And like you said too, like living with him, like, yeah, yes, absolutely. He's all around me. I mean, in November, it was... um uh, it's uh, I share this story, but in November, my younger son got engaged. We were on a cruise for Thanksgiving, oh. um, and he he's getting gonna get engaged. And so I went up to visit Matthew at his gravesite because we weren't gonna be here for Thanksgiving Day, and it was really important to me that you know to acknowledge that he's still part of our lives. So while mm-hmm. everybody was finishing getting ready here at the house, I ran up real quick and I, you know, I wanted to clean off his headstone and just, you know, tell, give him some thanks, you know, from us. And I literally said, your brother's going to get engaged the day before thanks, one day on the cruise this week. So I don't know what day it is because I literally didn't know what day my son was going to ask his girlfriend. But on that day, give us a sign that you are there with us. And 
the craziest thing, and those of you that are listening that have that are on this path or just starting this path, watch for signs because they do show up. They are with us. You know, people sometimes I my my younger son thinks I'm crazy, but I'm like, I I'm telling you what, you know, when it happens, if you pay attention, you will see your brother is around you. You're just thinking it's other things, you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember before my son passed, he used to say all the time, Mom, I see Mimi everywhere, which is my mother-in-law. Mimi's always around. I I see her, she's you know, this or that. So I, that the day that my son asked my, um, my older son asked his girlfriend, Amy for her hand in marriage. Um, I, my phone, for some reason, Suzanne, when he passed, I upgraded my phone and mm-hmm. our numbers got merged somehow. I don't know how mm-hmm. I just don't, it's a God thing. So every once in a while I'll get a text for, from, for him, from somebody that doesn't know his past. And that's a whole conversation I have to have with them, you know, and kind of like revisit it. But that day that Nate asked Amy for his hand in marriage, um, we got back to the, to the room the, on the cruise ship and we were in the same text string that we had all been on. So it was my husband and I, Nate and his girlfriend, now fiance and my sister and brother-in-law. And so in that text string later on that evening, we got back. I was like, hey, what time are we meeting for dinner? Are we doing, are we doing the normal dining room? Are we doing a specialty dining room? And my husband goes, why'd you send that for Matt's number? I'm like, I didn't send that for Matt's number. I'm like, literally, I went, look, here's the phone. It's, this is, you know, and so mm-hmm. he goes, it's showing up from Matthew. And I'm like, okay, let me send you a text separately. So I sent him a text. It was coming from Matthew's number. And I mm-hmm. said, Charles, I did nothing to this phone. I am in the same texting, everything. And the next morning, I text in there. It was from my number. So I yeah. told my husband, go, I asked him for a sign. He gave us a sign. And my husband is sort of like coming into understanding that the signs are there, like recognizing. And so I'm getting him to be more aware of what's the surroundings when they show up. And he actually is starting to talk more with his, with Matthew, you know, having mm-hmm. out loud conversations with him. And so he's like, okay, son, you know, you really should have been here because it was, you know, we were both, you know, and you, yeah. and I, you know, and those that are listening, yep. you go through those moments when you're really pissed off at them for not being here and, or you go through the moments of going, I know you're not here, but thank you for being here. Right. And so yep. I, I, I just love that you, you know, you share, you share that with us. And also I just, I want those that are listening to know we're not crazy, but there are signs around you all the time, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so I want you to tell us a little, tell us about your son and a little bit of your journey and, and share with us, like, you know, many times I'm in a grief group I go to once a month. And I remember the first time I attended, there was a lady that was there and she lost her son. And I believe her grandson later on, and she, it had been 15 years Mm -hmm. and she was like, you know, she was sharing her story and she was crying. And she's like, this is why I don't want to come to these things because every time I come, I cry. And I reached across the table from her and I grabbed her hand and I said, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for letting me know that even 15 years down the line, Mm -hmm. it's going to feel like it just was yesterday. Thank you for letting me know that the feeling is still going to be there and that I can still live and come to live my life even with that feeling, you know? And so I love that you, you know, and the girl who started our group, she lost her son. So Lisa started the group out of, you know, so share with us about your son, um, share a little bit about your story and then what led you to start doing what you're doing. Um, Thank you. And I want to help people understand, you know, when I'm working with people who want to support someone better, a lot of the time they're held back from saying anything because they don't want to make it worse and they don't want to remind the person. So I want to start by saying, you will never be reminding us. We will always remember. So asking someone to talk about their lost loved one who's died is actually a real gift. I love talking about Ben. It helps keep him present in my life. It helps other people know him. And it's really something that's a gift and not a burden. And I think it's important for people who haven't been through this experience to understand that. And if the the person doesn't want to share, they get to say, no, I'd rather not talk about them right now. But I love when people say, oh, you know, what would Ben have thought of that? Or, you know, oh, I thought of him today because I saw such and so. It's like sharing those remembrances and those memories and those connections is really, really important. So thank you for modeling beautifully how to do that. Uh, ben was uh, 22 when he died. He was um, managing a fashion clothing store, a brand, high fashion brand clothing store. And, you know, loved fashion, architecture, art. He was super artistic. 
Um, he was profoundly gifted. So I, I ex- the easiest way to explain that is by saying, well, there's a couple of funny stories, but I'll only share one because I try to not share stories about his sister too much because she'll get mad at me. Um, so I, I explain how gifted Ben was by saying he read the Harry Potter books in kindergarten and his self-chosen summer reading book between grade three and grade four was Moby Dick. So he was never going to fit in at school. He was never going to enjoy what was happening at school. He was never going to be challenged by school. And that was just the reality. Um, So lots of trauma happened for him at school, unfortunately, at the hand of students, teachers, and administration. It's not just the students. Um, You know, there's issues with some teachers and some administrators. I'm not here to throw them all under the bus because many of them were fabulous with him. He, you know, managed to get out of high school, which was our goal. He changed schools in the spring break of grade 12. So that tells you a little bit about how hard it was and how much he was struggling. We were like, yeah, I don't care. We're pulling you from that school. We'll find a place where you can graduate. And I remember saying to him, we have not put in all this work for you to give up now. Like getting to grade 12 has been so hard. You cannot give up in the spring break of grade 12. There's like two months to go. Like you, we, we got to figure out how to we just suck it up and get done what needs to get done. And he had I think he still needed to finish English, which was such a joke because he'd read Moby Dick in grade three. So English was not a hard credit for him. And he had to do some grad transition program shenanigans. But anyway, so he graduated. Um, Yeah, he was just a really unique, funny, smart as a whip. Like I couldn't keep up with him. And gifted brains, it's really interesting. They just work differently. So it was always a real adventure for me as like a smart person. Like I'm pretty smart. But I don't have that giftedness where my brain just works a different way than other people's. And his brain just worked a different way. The way he saw the world was just different. So it was really fun to be along on that journey of, you know, seeing the world the way that he saw it. Um, He died. uh, I, you know, different experience than yours. I got the phone call from the police. (laughs) Um, So I got that middle of the night phone call that every parent dreads um, to tell me that Ben had died. And my daughter and I were away just about two hours, hour and a half away from home. So we weren't far away for the weekend. And so, yeah, I had to go tell her and phone the kid's dad. And, you know, so it begins. The telling still is the hardest part. You know, I would say to anyone, if you're at those early stages, if you can find a way to tell a lot of people at once, which we did a couple of different ways and was such a relief, if you can pass that on to other people and get them to do the telling, it's still like a stab to the heart to have to, you know, if someone hasn't heard and they'll say, oh, how's Ben? And you have to tell them. And it's even worse because now it's like three years they haven't known. And there's all that drama that they didn't know. And uh, it's just awful. So, you know, the best things we did was do big ways of telling people and just, yeah, figure out how to breathe. And, and I agree with you. Like you said, like for those who are listening to the story for the first time, um, you know, I lost my son in a tragic car accident. I didn't get the phone call. I found out in the news. We were talking yeah. to Matthew. He was in my car, my registration. Everything was tied. He was on the way to his girlfriend's house, but she was newly moving in with her. Um, unfortunately, he made the choice to drink. So he was drinking and driving. And he thought he ran a stop sign. And you can't see the stop sign. We, we went by there. Um, there was a previous accident the year before and or two years before, they never replaced a flashing sign that said stop ahead. Mm-hmm. So there was nothing that you could see. And, and I've been up by there. I mean, it's very dark out there. So um, the police didn't come to my door. They tried every, they've tried every excuse down to their, their answer is human error. It's human error, but they use a computer system. Okay. But anyway, so like, <laughs> like Suzanne was saying, I didn't get that phone call. I didn't get the knock at the door. Three days after he passed, I literally was still reading the paper that they were investigating, wanted more information. So my phone call came from me emailing the investigator saying, well, this is his mom. And how would you feel if your mom found out that way? And like two seconds later, I got the phone call. So, and I like what you said too. So one of the things that we did, um, because I, you know, I saw the news, I called, you know, I called my girlfriend really quickly because my husband was not home. He was dropping Mm -hmm. some French kids that were visiting us off at Bush Gardens um, and of course, I'm not going to tell him that on the phone. And when he left, he goes, when I get home, we'll figure out trying to find him. So I called my girlfriend here locally right away, Jacqueline, and she came over right away. Like she arrived at the house as my husband was getting home. So it was just perfect to have somebody there with me. Mm. But um, I called my mom and then I was like, I got to let people know. And you were talking about telling your daughter. So our son, Nate, is not on social media. And so I didn't want to put anything out on social media until we could get to Nate to tell Nate. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so at first Chuck was like, well, he's at work. And then it hit me. 
He works from home on Mondays. We need to leave now. We need to get in the car now and get over to his place before he maybe sees it on the news, right? And thank God, because by that afternoon, the news was naming him in the paper, even though we still didn't know, right? So- It's just ridiculous. It's this is just, not human error. This it's is not like a level error. of competence Absolutely. that's just beyond beyond. But anyways. Absolutely not human error. So we went over, you know, and of course, we're, here we are, we're showing up Nate's apartment in the middle of a work day. And we, yeah. you know, we bring the little box downstairs and, um, and he's like, why are you coming here? I'm like, we, you know, we got to go talk. So we, we, you know, we shared this, we told Nate and everything. Then at that point we did go on, like you were saying, like finding a mechanism to get the word out. So yeah. when we found out there's a, a, a beautiful nonprofit here, it's called Angel Foundation and they help local families with tragic things that happen or things like, you know, they, if they've gotten sick and they can't pay a bill, there's businesses mm. like even my own business, we donate every month to them. So I donate every month, not ever expecting I was going to need assistance yeah. from them. Right. And so all I do is say to my friend, Jack, I'm like, Hey, I need somebody to come clean my house. Cause I've just had four kids in my house. and I know all this family's going to come. I wasn't asking for a handout. And literally they said, that's what we do, Pearl. That's why we do what we do. So yeah. they golfed us around them. So that evening, we decided to use social media to put the word out because we knew yeah. that was the fastest way to get it out. Other than the immediate mm -hmm. family knowing, we knew that was the fastest way. The challenge with that is that some of Matt's friends are not my friends, so they didn't know, right? And try to get right. that word out and everything. So through his friends, we kind of got most of the word out. However, I didn't know till almost a year later after Matthew had passed um, through Matt's struggles, he had, um, he, before he went to go get help and he, and let me make it clear that if you are listening to this and you are somebody who struggles with addictions, please reach out for help. Mm -hmm. Um, he had reached out for help and, you know, unfortunately when he passed, he made a decision that took him off the path of, of sober. And so, um, why he had his deepest struggles with the sobriety with, with what led him to rehab, um, he had gotten involved with a group that. We we called it a cult, but he wasn't recognized as a cult. When he went through rehab, he definitely called it a cult. So they took it upon themselves, which I did not know. And I believe truly it's divine intervention that we did not know the day, the, the, like the day that Matthew passed, they took his death and made a whole YouTube. And there's still YouTube out there that I'm trying to get out oh about how Matthew passed because they cursed him, Matt, you know, all these things. And then try to claim that Matthew would commit suicide. So here it is a year later. And I, that's, listen, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to war for my kids, even my husband. Mm -hmm. So I literally mm -hmm. called and Matt's girlfriend was like, mama Pearl, you are so strong. I literally called the guy on the carpet. I called him up and said, you know, what you're doing is wrong. But because that was out, I didn't know. And for some reason, you know, again, I didn't know. It's, I think I know why. If we'd known right away, I think, unfortunately, I would have had my brother, my nephews, some of his buddies probably go after, you know, to yeah. stand up for Matthew. So I didn't know that. So for so long, people would say that Matthew would commit suicide. And I was like, where are they getting this from? Well, when I found out, I was like, that's where they got it from. So I've done a few mm -hmm. different social media posts about, let me make sure it's clear and understood, you know, because something I want to go back to, I want to circle back around that you talked about too, is, to, is what people say to you, because that was the one thing that, and like you said, reminding us, we, we don't mind you remind us. We want it. We, we remember him every single minute we wake up, right? Every single part of our day, there's some part of the day, you know, it's not. And those of you that are listening that are new in your grief journey, there's going to come a day you're going to wake up in the morning and go, oh, I didn't think about him first thing this morning. And that's okay. That's part of that journey, right? Yeah. But there'll be part of the day where you're going to remember him or something's going to come on the, the radio or whatever. And so I remember a friend calling me and she's like, I just don't know what to say. And I'm like, that's the best thing you could say to me. Yep. That's the best thing you say to me. Please don't say, oh, he's in a better place. Please don't say, at least you still have Nate. Please don't say those things because trust me, I know this world is not great right now, but I still would rather have him right here next to me than not be next to me, right? Yeah. And so better place, I don't know yet. I Do I believe heaven's a better place? Absolutely, but I'm not there. So my place, I'd rather have him here, but that's between him and God, right? So to say those things, it's like, don't, don't say those things to me, right? But at the same time, you know, being, just reminding us it's okay because I, it's like I tell everybody, the first thing we said, Suzanne, when everybody started coming in, 
And the one thing the three of us did, we went and told Nate, I said to my husband and my son, do not hold back tears for me. Do not Mm -hmm. hold back your feelings for me. I need you to show the emotions that come along because I need to know that you remember. And it helps me know that I'm not alone in this journey. And so Mm -hmm. when family was starting to come, the one thing we said to them is we did, we said, please don't hold back memories. Please don't hold back sharing. Please don't hold back tears because then we know that you're on this journey with us and you're feeling Mm -hmm. our, our loss as well. And I remember I was in a grocery store and I was getting something at the deli and I just sat in there and I saw this, this young man standing next to me. And for a quick second, he looked like Matthew from the back. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden I started crying and the man behind the counter goes, is everything okay? Like, like he thought, I'm like, oh no, no, I'm fine. Like, I'm such a stupid question. Obviously not, but carry yeah. on with your day. Uh, uh, he deli like, meat. I'd like to go like, now. <laughs> uh, I think he thought like, did I upset her? Or did that take too long? I'm yeah. like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm just having a moment. Right. So, so I love that you remind us that, you know, to look at it, you know, as, as it's a beautiful memory and to let those waves, mm-hmm. I think it's really important and you coach on this. So I'm going to let you speak to this. I mm-hmm. think it's really important too, to let the waves come when they come. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, especially for grieving parents, you know, there's that kind of story that we're going to get stuck there, right? Our life is never going to be the same, which has this subtext of it, meaning that we're never going to be functional, which of course isn't true. It's true that our life is never going to be the same, but there's all kinds of ways to be functional. Um, and I think you're right. You know, the fear for the griever, I think, is that if we face the grief, if we allow it, we'll be overwhelmed and we'll get stuck there. But the reality is we get stuck in denying it. If we're trying to keep it in a little box and it's this kind of a rupture that's, you know, that life changing and you've lost your child, you've lost yourself, you've lost a whole bunch of friends, you've lost all kinds of other things, right? The layered losses are really complicated. You can't ignore it. You can't deny it. You have to let those emotions come. You have to let the waves come and just go through, you know, the water metaphors for grief are the best for me. And I'm kind of a water person anyway. And I describe it by saying that For me in the early days, it's like a tsunami. Like you're just underwater all the time. You don't know how to breathe. You don't know how to take care of yourself. You don't know how to feed yourself. You really don't know how to do anything. And that's okay. What I realized quite early was I wasn't actually a piece of like driftwood or like broken up sailboat. I always had this vision of like a very, very glamorous broken up sailboat. I don't know why, (laughs) but that was not actually what I was. I was actually a piece of cork. And every once in a while, I would bob to the surface. And when I knew that, everything became more survivable because I knew I couldn't control it and I didn't know when it was going to happen. But there would be moments where I bobbed up to the surface, I could gasp a breath, I could kind of look around, figure out how the world operated a little bit, and then another wave would come and I'd be gone again. But I knew that I would, you know, I had that buoyancy, right? I would at some point somehow make it back up to the surface, do the same thing again. And then your time on the surface gets longer and longer, right? And then you kind of realize like I was a rowboat was my next phase. I'm ter- I don't know if you've ever tried to row a rowboat. I'm terrible at it. It's impossible. I'm like around in circles, never going to get where I want to go. Couldn't actually control the rowboat, but at least most of the time I'm on the surface, right? So that's a little more bearable. And then you're kind of in like a nice motorboat and you can kind of drive it most of the time, but sometimes the waves are too big for your little boat, right? And then the boat just gets bigger. The waves get smaller, they're, you know, they still come. There's still an occasional tsunami that swamps the boat and you're back underwater. But you know, by that point that, you know, this is temporary, this too shall pass. Right. And there is a way back to the surface, but those early days, really the disorientation, the confusion, the brain fog is real. You know, the, the symptoms that people don't tell us about are part of what then make the grief more complicated because I really honestly thought, because I didn't know enough about grief myself. I knew that Ben had died, so he's now gone. I knew the person who had gone to bed that night before I got the phone call no longer existed. That was very clear about that. I'm with you. There's a before and after. There's a line there. There's like old me and now me. (laughs) And you know, one day they'll maybe, I don't know, weave more together. More parts of me will come over. I don't know. So you've lost your child. I've lost myself. And somehow I also had instant onset, some kind of brain disease because my brain did not function at all. Of course, what I had was grief brain, brain fog, trauma brain, all kinds of names for it. It's a real thing that happens. 
for a couple of really well-documented um, scientific reasons, your brain is, they've actually done some functional MRIs now on grooving people, really fascinating research coming out from a brilliant researcher in the States. Um, and really your brain is reprogramming itself. It's partly protecting you from the shock and dismay, right? And kind of makes everything a little bit foggy. And it's also having to reprogram like all, and if you think about it, it makes so much sense. So if you are a griever or you've been in deep grief before, you can, you can imagine this moment where your brain is saying to you, oh yeah, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell Ben about that. And as you're thinking that thought, it kind of fritzes out and it kind of goes, Bleh. that's how best I can describe it. I'm not a scientist. You can tell. That is because your brain is literally having to reprogram that pathway. Because that pathway that says, oh, I'm going to go home and tell Ben about that hits the pathway that knows that Ben is dead and you can't do that anymore. And you get that little fritz. And those get better, right? The pathways reprogram. They re-coordinate and realign with your new reality. But that takes time. It's a physical thing happening in your brain that takes time. And so one of the most important things we can do to help people, you know, you're talking about what can we say? I'm with you. When I think about my stalwart companions, who I call the wonderful sort of quintet of people that stuck with me and are still there, almost every single one of them started with something like, I have no idea what to say. There are no words, but I care about you deeply and I'm here for you and we'll figure it out. I will help you figure it out. We will figure it out together. I will just sit here if that's all you need. So saying that, starting there, starting with what's real, what's real is as a collective, as a society, we don't know what to say. All those old cliches and platitudes, don't say those. <laughs> if you hear anything today, don't say those. They're so harmful. The subtext of all of them is terrible. As you say, he's in a better place. Whatever your belief system is, I'm a mom. There's no better place for my child than by me. Yes, I have another child. That doesn't mean it's not horrifying that one of them is no longer here. Like none of that is good. I don't know what to say. I care about you. Can I help you figure it out? What do you need at this moment? Do you need tea or coffee? A specific offer. The griever also cannot conceptualize what they might need at some magical day at some moment. So I'm here for you. Anything you need, let me know. Not helpful. Best of intentions, but not helpful. Specific offer. I'm going to the grocery store. Do you need bread? Go to your fridge, open it, tell me what's missing. I'll bring it to you this afternoon. I love that you're saying that too, because that was one of the things too. I remember like, like the eating part. I remember about day three after Matthew had passed, we're so, uh, we were planning the funeral and everything. I remember going, I'm not hungry and I did not want to lose weight like this, right? I remember like yeah. being <laughs> like, I need to eat because I know that's what I need to do, right? But, so, you know, and to have people come in and be like, Hey, we're going to bring, you know, and have people, you know, the food, it was just so amazing. And it has to be like my girlfriend, like organize that, you know, once I, yeah. and I, I literally said, I don't need anything until everybody comes. Cause I know I got food in the house. I just need you to make sure I'm eating what's in the house. So she yeah. did exactly what you did. Pearl, what have you eaten today? What can I bring you by? You know, just you. And then once everybody was coming, cause we had probably like 30 people out of state coming in. So, you know, it's like, what do you need? What can we bring over? Cause people were of course congregating at our house. And so yeah. that was, so that was so helpful. It was just so, so helpful. And, um, and you know, I like what you called the cork, the bobbing, the bobbing. Cause that's so true. Yeah. I mean, even as, and and the brain fog. I, I want to talk about the brain fog first before I talk about the bobbing. I had gone through COVID and I yep. remember having brain fog with COVID. So when it yep. showed up in my grief, I'm like, I knew right away what it was. But if I had not had through COVID, I wouldn't have known, you know? And so to do my work that I do, you know, I work, I help a company with some stuff. And I was like, I need you to know like when I came back into starting to help them do the project I was helping them on, I'm like, I need you to know that if I miss something, tell me because I have, I have fog and I don't know where it's going to show up, how it's going to show up. And I literally can tell you that up until, so Matt passed July 22, I can tell you the two, the other part of the brain fog slash depression, because I know mm -hmm. it, you know, you're going to go through depression which is shown up in like how organized I am at home. Cause normally I'm yep. very organized. It will show up in ways you're like, I fixed that problem. Like I used to be very unorganized. I had a friend come help me organize my bedroom and my room has become a, a disaster. And I'm like, that's depression. Like my husband's going, I'm like, you need to bear with me. That's depression. And yep. I'm trying to work through it. Right. So that that's one of my goals I created for myself for the, for the first 12 weeks right now. And so, 
I love that you talk about how it, the, the bobbing the cork. I love that part because as much as I thought I'm rolling in the rowboat, like you said, I'm we're rowing around really, really well. Thanksgiving week, we're on that cruise. It was our first vacation yeah. with as a family without Matthew. And then Thanksgiving day came and I was just like, I was so overwhelmed with the crying and the war, you know, just the, I sat outside and I tried to, we had a balcony, a beautiful, a beautiful view of the ocean while we're coming back. And I was just like really, really struggling with it. And I mean, I even tried to go eat with everybody. I wore, I never wore sunglasses at the table. I had sunglasses <laughs> on. I mean, yeah, like the no whole manners. thing. Never mind, yeah. who cares? And yeah. And so then I finally said, I have to get up from this table. And I went and sat by a table, you know, some results and my husband came over and he's like, are you okay? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm really having a huge wave right now. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I'm, you know, again, I'm not hiding it from the family, but I just, this is a huge, huge wave. And so I worked through that, you know, and then, it, you know, of course I let the way, I, I felt the wave. I felt the cork bobbing mm -hmm. up as you called it. Right. And okay. I think it's important if you're listening to us, if you take that lesson, if there's one thing you remember out of this is of course, let the waves come. Because when you, like you said, when you push them down, it's going to show up somewhere. And then when yeah. it comes, the person on the other side, that may be the person you don't want to take it out of because they're just going to be there to, to take it for you. But let it come. And if you're not sure how to let it come, like somebody like Suzanne having a coach or getting a therapist is so pivotal in that journey. Like, I'm so thankful that Lisa started our grief group. I'm so thankful that we have that, that I can go to that outlet and have them there for me when I need them, you know? And so, um, so I want to talk about like, what are, let's talk about what you do and how, how you decided that, what was the, the pivotal point for you that said, I want to do something with my story, with my journey. Cause like, I know as, as a mental fitness coach, my journey started because I was a people pleaser because mm. my self-care sucked. I didn't put my, <laughs> I, I wore all the titles you could give me. That's what the titles I wore. And one time after taking an identity and destiny course, I couldn't, I couldn't say my, I am statement. I still was saying mm -hmm. I was these titles. And so I had to go on the path to figure out who the heck I was. And in doing that, that's one of the things too, that helped me through Matt's passing. Matthew saw me step into who I am. He saw me mm -hmm. step into what I call the Shiro. He saw me step into identifying that I am overcoming a people pleaser. I no longer have to say yes to everything. I can say no to things. And so he saw me live that. So part of that, of him seeing me that, is that that inspired me to keep living that way. Because in my mm -hmm. mind, I was like, I can go and sit in my room and I'm sure everybody will understand if I'm never coming out of my room from grief, but I still have this life to live. I, yeah. I believe in you know what Matthew saw me live. He would want me to continue doing that. And number two, I have an amazing son, Nate, that's got a whole life ahead of him that I want to show up for. You know, and I don't want him to be like living in Matthew's grief because mom's depressed, right? And and it's okay if you're depressed. I'm not saying that that's not okay, but I had to make the choice. And I think too, Suzanne, and you can, I'll let you talk to this is some, sometimes it is a choice. Sometimes we have to choose to say, okay, I have to figure out how to live this new life with this grief while still living a life, right? Yeah. Yeah. So talk to that and yeah. tell us. Like what was, what made you decide to take the path of what you're doing today? Yes to all of that. It is, and it's a hundred percent about making choices. And I say to people that are, especially if you're in those early days yet. And when I talk about early days, I'm talking about the first six months to a year. Like for me, the early grief is like the first two years. Let's not even pretend it's any different. Um, it is about choices and they're little choices. You know, there's no big leaps in grief. It's little choices every day, every moment. You know, what can I do right now? What am I, what are my capacities? You know, when you talk about self-care, I remember in my early days of grief, I would, when I started to kind of follow grief educators or grief experts to try and figure out what the heck was happening to me. And sometimes they post those, you know, how to help your grief, you know, like the 10 self-care tips or whatever. And it was always like, you know, meditate, go for a walk, be in nature, ha have a drink of water, get some sleep. I'm like, all of them maybe want to punch people in the throat. They made me so, so angry. For me, that self-care piece was giving myself complete permission to just be a grieving mom, whatever that meant in any moment. And 
you know, one of the big breakthrough moments for me, one of my stalwart companions, we were on a walk one day and she said to me, you know, how, how long do you think you can, you're going to do this? And it was maybe at the three month mark, four month mark, something like that. And I remember kind of taking a few more steps and looking at her and saying, you know, I I think I'm going to do this forever. Like, I think I'm going to be in grief forever. And so when I realized that, I realized that I had to figure out a way to be in grief and have a life. It's a both and, right? Grief is all about holding paradox. It's all about the both and. How do I grieve the death of my child and find a life for myself? And a life, as you say, that honors my child that's still here, that honors that my child that died. It doesn't honor him for me to curl up into a ball and fade away. That doesn't honor him either. He lived a big life. He had a big personality, a big presence. Nothing honors that, you know, in me pulling back and shying away. So that was part of it. And the other part of it was the writing. So for me, writing was a matter of survival. I had to write to get the spin out of my head, that griefy brain that just would spin and spin and spin in the same thoughts. I had to get them out. And I shared that writing on Facebook, as you do, right? (laughs) On my personal page with friends and family. And the response I got from people was so overwhelmingly positive. And so many people were saying things like, you're really helping me understand. I've never really understood this before. Nobody talks about it the way that you are talking about it. No one shares what's really happening for them. Like no one is public about it. And I thought, oh, I'm a grieving mom, grieving out loud. Welcome. Like, I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable. This is how I'm going to survive this. That for me was my path. I was going to be a grieving mom, grieving out loud. And that was just a matter of survival. And I know that's not everybody's path. And I don't counsel or you know coach people that that is the path. The path is the one that suits you. That was the right path for me. And it made me really realize that there's a bigger problem afoot here in our inability to talk about grief and our inability to support people appropriately. And what ends up happening is at a time when what we're all really craving is connection, the grieving person and the people supporting them are really craving connection. What we're creating, because we don't know any better, is isolation. So if I could share my story, share what I was learning, and then of course I went on to do education and get certified and, you know, become an endless student of everybody's writing and reading and, you know, all of that. You know, if I could share what I was learning because now I was so passionate about this as a matter of my own survival. And then as a question of, you know, what could this be about? Like, I was very clear that this horrifying, awful experience that I am going through, have gone through, was not going to be for nothing. So if I'm going to be doing this forever and it's not going to be for nothing, what is it about? And it's about talking about it and opening up conversations and letting people know that it's okay to feel awkward. It's okay to say, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to help you, but I'm here to figure it out if you're open to that, right? It's about just opening our hearts at a time when we feel really scared. The griever is scared because we don't know what's happening to us. The support person is scared because they don't want to make it worse. They don't want to do the wrong thing, but they don't know what the right thing is. We're just all scared. (laughs) And if you believe as I do that there is only fear or love, we have to move away from the fear and towards the love. And if we can do that, you know, as a colleague, as an employer, like what if you're, when you went back to work, your employer had been able to say, oh, we know that you probably are having some brain fog. And so here's the way that we help people that are experiencing brain fog. Would some of those things be helpful for you? That makes a huge difference because you know, it's real. You and luckily had had the experience where you could name it. You kind of understood it. You knew it was temporary, right? People like me who had no idea it was coming were like, oh crap, I don't want to say too much about that because there's clearly something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with us. We're in grief. So if we all can understand it better, know more about it, then we can support each other in a much more meaningful and actually helpful way. And I love you're talking about that. Love that you talk about, you know, there's the 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 two correlations, like how to live with grief. Like we have to figure out that that path of how to live with it. And then, you know, you're right at, at companies and corporations because life goes on. You know, you get so much time off from your job. So if you're listening and you're not an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, you can take all the time you want, but you still got to run a business, right? So you got to yeah, pay the bills. Yeah, you still got to pay. So you got to figure out how, yeah. how does that look? Like allowing yourself, 
a little bit of time on your counter to do what you need to do for your business, but then giving yourself the grace of taking time for yourself off the counter, right? And maybe that looks like you don't have as many in-person meetings with people, you know, and and those type of things. But you're right, when you go in, if you're a professional that doesn't have the benefit of, I'm a self-employed person that can kind of fluctuate with my calendar based on what I'm feeling. But if you got to show up to a nine to five job or some kind of job in that capacity, and you only get maybe three days off. I mean, I remember my, so when my son, you know, he, he had newly been in his job. I think he'd been in his job maybe 30 days. So, you know, for me as his mom, I was like, oh my gosh, how's this going to look for him? What are they going to do? He works for an amazing company. It's called CAE. And they were like, Nate, take the time you need to take. If you need a week off, don't worry about it. You know, if you need more time, just let us know. Like they were so amazing. But his girlfriend now, fiance, also work there. So in my head, I'm like going, I know she wants to be here for Nate, but how will that look for her? And same thing. So they were blessed that they had an employee, employer that was like, listen, we want to wrap you and support you in whatever way we can. And even when he went back, I know that he talked about how they were like, if you need to work just small days or work from home more, you know, they were very flexible with that. But not everybody can get that benefit when they go to their corporation. So let's talk about that a little bit. Like, let's talk about from the employer side and the employee side, like how does that look and how can you communicate either side? Like as the employee going, I got to go back to work and I may be sitting at my desk and it may look like I'm busy, but I'm sitting here crying. I'm just stuck because I've got this fog coming up, right? So talk to us about that. And then also maybe Suzanne share for those that are listening that maybe own a company, like what are some of the tips that they can do to help that employee that's going through something like this? Yeah, there's all kinds of things that we can do. Mostly cost neutral, very inexpensive. Um, as you say, it's a lot about flexibility. The thing that's so interesting in grief is it's this universal experience that we will all have, and we all have all the time, right? I'm talking about we're you know we're talking obviously about the loss of our sons, which is a big grief, but we have grief for every loss, right? Every change brings loss. Every loss brings grief. Grief is around us all the time. What helps people the most is that flexibility. It's the ability to have a conversation first of all. So as from the employer's perspective, what I hear a lot is they don't want to be anybody's therapist. Great. Nobody's asking you to be anybody's therapist. That's not going to be healthy for anyone. And they want not very much drama. The interesting thing is, you know, when I'm working with an organization, our end game, if we're doing a big program, is to end up with a policy. So it's documented. We know when you come, and I'm talking about when you're at work. So this is after you're three to five days off, that's starting to change. Thank goodness there's some really big companies I'm super excited that are starting to change their policies, are pushing up to 20 to 30 days off, which is where we need to end up. That's a whole different episode. When the person's at work is where I'm helping people because we're in a culture where we don't know how to say anything. We don't know what to do. So if you have a policy that has how I describe it as a menu, it's a menu of things to pick from as your son had offered. Would it be helpful to work from home? Would it be helpful to have flexible hours? Would it be helpful to have shorter hours? Like what are the things that you can offer that are tangible, that are not super costly, right? It's more costly to replace this person when they leave because you didn't acknowledge their grief appropriately. The hidden cost in the US right now is about $127 billion a year of grief in the workplace. It's expensive and it's not expensive to fix the problem. So you need to be able to have a conversation that, for most of us, is going to feel awkward and uncomfortable. Oh, well, welcome to leadership. That's just how it goes. (laughs) Having that conversation is really important. A place to start as we started at the very, very beginning is what about the telling? What if when your employee was about to come back, their immediate supervisor or a close colleague phoned them and said, we know you're back tomorrow. Do you want us to make sure everybody knows before you come? Yes or no? That's a lovely offer, right? Would you like us to tell everyone? So you already know, everybody knows you don't have to say anything. Do you want people to approach you tomorrow or would you rather have people approach you slowly over the coming days and just have tomorrow be a day you come and catch your breath? Do you want to come for a full day tomorrow, your first day back? Like the fact that we give people three to five days off and then we expect them to come back full-time like nothing ever happened is an inhuman ask. It's impossible. So we have that exact thing you're describing, that employee who is full on presenteeism. I'm here. Nothing is getting done. I feel terrible. And the thing that happens when you don't acknowledge it up front and you don't have a system in place to support people, that's when you get the drama that nobody wants. Because now I'm unsupported. 
I'm under the water in my tsunami. I'm crying at my desk. And now everybody is coming around to see what's wrong, (laughs) right? Whereas if we had a system where someone had already told everybody, they knew I was coming back for the first day. I just wanted to hold it together. And then please, yes, come with your condolences the next day. We have an agreement that if I get overwhelmed, I get to go for a walk for 10 minutes. So if I'm not at my desk, you know, I have my cell phone and I'll be back in 10 minutes or less. Like there's structures we can put in place that give that person permission to be at work, be productive and be grieving because we want them to reintegrate. We want them to feel valued. We know they're valuable, but they have to feel that. And when you feel isolated, when you feel like nobody knows what to say, when tasks are taken away from you as a way of helping you, but with no conversation and are never given back. Like I've heard so many stories from people about what has happened at their workplaces through the best of intentions that just go wrong and just miss the mark. So it's a lot about collaborative, right? It's about having conversations up front. What if as a team, you had a meeting that said, wow, we know people are experiencing high levels of grief right now. How could we support each other better? Like one one, um, brainstorming session I was in, someone said, well, what if we did a lunch train? Brilliant. Mondays, Sally brings an extra lunch. Tuesday, John brings an extra lunch. Wednesdays, it's Martha. Everybody brings an extra lunch each day. That person knows they're going to get fed. Feeding ourselves in early grief is really hard. I don't know why, but it's really hard. So if you can take care of that, brilliant. Can you drop your dress code? Is it that important? Do you even still have one? Hopefully not. Hopefully we're mostly past that, but a lot of places do still have them. Implicit or explicit, they still have them. Can you say to the person, you know what? If you come and your private parts are covered, we're happy. Leggings are fine. Leggings and a sweatshirt, bring it on, right? There's things you can take off the person's plate that just make life easier. So that's part of the process. From the employee's perspective, it's really hard if you're the griever in those early days to have to go and advocate for yourself. So that's why my work is on the other side. It's with the leadership. It's with the colleagues. It's with the C-suite. It's with the supervisors. Yes, we're going to talk to the frontline employees. We're going to talk to everybody on the team and say, like, if you were struggling, what would be helpful? We want that brainstorming session. We want to do grief education for everyone. We want to up-level everybody's understanding. And then we want to create something that's equitable, that's applied evenly to everyone, that gives us a framework for conversation. That conversation is going to be awkward. But if you have a framework, where you can say, oh, we have that policy. Let's pull it out together and take a look at how we could help you. How much easier is that than you having to go and say, I think I might, there might be something wrong with my brain. I can't really concentrate very well. And them having to say, oh, okay, well, we don't really know what to do about that. And then we're all just all kind of banging into each other. So much easier if we've had this conversation up front. I I love that what all the, the great examples you put together from an employer's standpoint I love the thought too like when you said about the lunch because what I think that also can create is that like that one-to-one lunch so if I'm bringing you lunch Suzanne I'm like come on let's go have lunch together so you and I can have like a quiet time lunch and just kind of be there you know if you want to talk we can talk if you don't want to talk it's fine you know but just want you know we're thinking of you and I love like you're right because I think this you know there's all different things that grief like divorce there's you know of course the grief that we're talking about there's you know there's there's loss of a home you know there's different kinds of grief so knowing how to approach those those challenges that come up as an employer is so so important because like you said it costs so much money to replace an employee so if we can do it at the front end it's so it goes so much further and also how does that that levels you up as a company too to say we're putting something in place because you matter to us. Like yeah. it, it reminded me when um, I worked for a company, it was a corporation uh, in Virginia. It was a telecom company before I got into my mortgage world. And um, we back, in, I'm going to really date myself. When you would send your payment in for your long distance phone bill, we yeah. had a, you wrote in a check and we had to hand process it. So that's how long ago this is. Okay. So hi kids, welcome to how the world used to work. <laughs> yes. So there was no online payment. So no. we were responsible to make sure every payment got processed by the last day of the month. So before mm-hmm. the next computer day. So even if it was two o'clock in the morning, the company by 9 a.m. that first day of the month, they had to all be in the system. So I had a team of eight of us. And so we had to process those payments. Well, those last two weeks of the month, that was like intense work. Like, yeah. and they were all salaried. They didn't get overtime pay, but they're expected to stay because that was their job title yeah. and that's what their responsibility. So I, you know, we had a thing where, you know, you had your lunch time and you had a break, but I would take my staff 
And I would be like, I would divide them up into two or three. And I'm like, okay, you guys go for a walk and go take your walk. Now I would make them take like these little quick walks. Mm -hmm. Right. And I had co co co-managers from other departments go, my employees are mad because your people are taking a walk. And now mind you talk about dress code. I love what you said about dress code. We had three piece suit dress codes. So we were dressed like we were, you know, a three piece suit dress codes. So I I look at them, I go, okay, when you're sitting at home, sitting back in your PJs, having your beer or having your soda or enjoying your family, guess where we are? We're sitting here at the computer entering payments in. So if you want to stay and your staff wants to stay, I'll give you breaks. I'll give you walk breaks. And I had my manager pull me aside. The person who was in charge of all of our departments. Pro, you can't do that. I go, well, you go tell them I can't do that. I'm not telling them I can't do that. You go tell them I can't do that. Because guess what? I need them to be able to be sharp when they're entering the payment in so I don't have to fix mistakes later, right? And so I, I love that you remind employers that we have to do that. We have to think about the what if. You know, what if somebody loses, you know, a loved one? What if somebody loses, you know, and the loss is different. You know, like you said, I've been with my husband 40 years. I think it would be just as heavy as it was my son, Mm -hmm. but maybe it was less time. You know, you you don't know what person, everybody's journey is, you know? And so I think that's really important because it is hard to advocate for ourselves. I could not imagine going back into a corporate world or into a retail space. And, you know, especially like retail, think about that. They got to interact with the customer. And I'm like, I, I would have had to quit on to like, to be honest. And, and it, I have really great conversations when I'm working with retail, retail companies about how complicated that is and how you need to provide break spaces. And, you know, some people you're able to put them in the back for a while and like, right. you have to be really creative, but I, I would have been like, I would have been out at customer yeah. service. You would have fired me or like, you would have stuck me in the stock room or something like right. it would not have been because you're having good. to interact with people and you're like going, the last thing I want to do is help you buy a shirt lady or a dress mister yeah. or whatever. And you know? your complaint about whatever this is, is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my, in my right. entire life because my world literally just fell apart. Exactly. And I don't care about what size you need. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, be very difficult. So, so to think about, you know, to work with those companies, I'm glad somebody like you is doing that because it, it's important work that we do. It's important work yeah. that you're doing that to say, these things can happen in your company. Do you want to keep that employee and what space can you create create for that employee or are you saying if they can't make it oh well i'll bring somebody in well that's let me show you how much money it's going to cost you you know yeah. because it's 20 percent of, of their salary to replace someone it's a lot yeah, of money. it's a lot of money to do that so yeah. so while we're talking about i just looked down like oh my gosh our time this has been a great conversation so tell suzanne tell our listeners like how they can work with you, where they can find you. We're going to put in the show notes and everything. And if you're watching on YouTube, I want you to make sure you hit the subscribe button and make comments of how this resonates with you. Um, If you're also listening and or watching and you know somebody that has lost a, you know, lost a loved one, especially a child, I want you to share this episode with them and let them know that both Suzanne and I's information is in the show notes. You can reach out to us at any time, but talk with us, Suzanne, like how somebody can find you and sort of like, what is that? I know you work with the employers a lot too. So help them understand what that looks like for you. So the best place to find me is on my website, which is suzannejabor.com. So you can head there and everything is there. Um, the the best place to under the best way let me phrase this better the best way to understand my approach and what I do with workplaces is to come to a masterclass I do those regularly I have a free hour long you know come and learn a little bit about what you can do you leave with some skills some mindsets some actionable things you can do right away um, to get started to sort of join us on the, in this movement um, so that's really great for the um, workplaces if you're and it's great for a leader it's great if you just want to be a better colleague you know I, I work with so many people who think oh my gosh my coworker this happened and I was not I didn't do really what I could have um, so it's great for everyone that's the best place and if you're needing personal support um, then the best way is again it's all it's all on the website. Um, but the best way is to just book a one-on-one session and then we can get together and, you know, see if my approach will work for you. If the kind of support I offer is what you need, um, because we need support. We need witnessing, you know, the universal about grief is it needs witnessing. And when we live in a culture that's grief phobic and not very grief intelligent, then it's really hard to get good witnesses. And so one of the things that, uh, you know, is the best thing that I can offer is witnessing and support to just understand that what's happening is normal. If you're experiencing it, someone else has, you know, none of us are broken. We don't need fixing. We just need to understand that what's happening is normal. We can breathe our way through it. 
and we can find our way one step, one baby step, one day at a time, because there is a life to be lived and it's ours. And the way that we live it is part of how we respect our loved one. I I love that, that, you know, the way we live it is, you know, so important. And, And also those that are listening, if you, Suzanne, you said something a second ago, that if you feel like, wow, now listen to Pearl and Suzanne, I'm thinking about my friend that, wow, I might've said this to her. You know what? Go see them. Pick up the phone and be like, hey, oh my gosh, I just listened to these two amazing moms that were sharing their journey about losing their son. And I realized, you know, maybe I said some things that I wasn't thinking about, or maybe I am not there for you. And I just want you to know that I'm here for you. Just reach out because I will tell you, that's the other thing too. My friends who are no longer in my life, because Mm -hmm. I think it's like, they don't know how or what to say or be around me. I mean, you know, that I think they struggle with that part, but I just want to tell them that's on them. Not on, don't worry about it. I'm good. Come just circle back around and be like, Hey, let's go out for coffee or I drink tea. So, you know, if you know me well yeah. enough, I'm going to have tea with you, but you know, just have that cup of coffee or tea and have conversation about that. You know, I, there's a, there's a, um, a lady here in town and she's listening. Her name is Sheila. Um, she lost her husband. And one of the things she did after Matthew passed, she reached out and said, come on, let's go have breakfast. You know, let me, she wanted to check on me. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing. And like, even at Christmas time, one of the, um, one of the attorneys that I, she's a friend of mine, but she's also an attorney that helped us. Um, do when the boys turn 18, she helped us do their power attorney so that, you know, if something yeah. happens and we've got, you know, things in place. She actually sent me a card, a beautiful card. And I text her, I go, oh my gosh, this card came at the perfect day. And it was just so sweet. It was one of those cards that said, hey, I'm watching what you're doing. I want you to know, I think you're so strong. And, you know, those things, those mean the world to me because it's like, I'm trying to show up, but how am I coming across? Right. So I yeah. think, so if that's, if that resonates with you, if you feel like, oh my gosh, I want to call my friend because I feel like I just need to check on her. And even if it's not over a grief, just because you haven't checked on one, we've inspired you. That's one of the things that I have a movement every July. It's called Make the Call for Matt. Because Matthew passed and trying to, we were talking about getting the word out. Some of his friends didn't know. So like a week, two weeks later, even to today, like I said earlier, I'll get random text messages that don't know that he's a lot, that he's no longer alive. And I have the conversation with them. And so Mm -hmm. every July, I'm like, If there's somebody, so if you're listening to this now, you don't have to wait till July, but if there's somebody you haven't talked to in a while, pick up the phone. Don't text them. Don't email them. Pick up the phone and let them hear your voice and be like, hey, I heard these two ladies talking. I just want to check on you, you know, and just check on your friends. So Suzanne, I'm so glad you're with us today. I'm so glad, you know, we talked about this. This is is a, a subject that's heavy for both of us in our hearts, but we know that it's a subject that needs to be shared to others so that we can, you know, our job is to sort of pay it forward to that mom who it's going to get that phone call, you know, hopefully get the phone call that knock on the door about their child passing. I mean, to uh, Christmas weekend, we lost three kids in different areas around my area in uh, city here to car accidents. Um, One was a 17 year old boy. And I actually was at an event over the weekend and his ex-girlfriend's mom was there. And I was talking to her and I said, please tell his mom to call me because the best thing too, that happened is one of Matt's friends, um, um, Kim sat with me, um, her, his, his friend's mom sat with me. And unfortunately, Austin also lost his life. And she sat with me and she's like, listen, one of the things she told me is Matt's over 18. If you get a medical bill or anything like that, you're not responsible. So don't feel like as your parent, you got to take care of that. But she just sat with me. She reaffirmed some things that we had decided. She helped me, you know, I called her when I had to pick up Matt's stuff. I'm like, I don't know that I can go pick them up by myself. Can you come with me? And so she was yeah. there because she knew the journey, right? So be there for somebody that possibly that ha- that's getting ready to walk the journey. That's really, really important. Um, so before we let you go, I shared with Suzanne that we're going to do the better questions, better life cards. So we're going to shuffle these and you're going to tell me when to stop and we're going to discuss the cards. So here we go. You tell me when to stop. Stop. Okay. That one, that one. Oh my gosh. I love this card. Because it's such, it's just how it resonates with you. It says, what if? Oh my gosh. (sighs) What if you lived your life from love instead of fear every day? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's your question. What if you lived your life from love instead of fear every day? I love that. That's so powerful. Like that can go so many different ways. That's such a powerful, powerful, powerful question. So if you're listening, like us on Spotify, Apple, wherever you're watching us, make sure you share us. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like and um, follow us and comment below what how this resonated with you. 
And I just want to thank you again, Suzanne, for coming and joining us today. I know this is a, you know, a, a needed subject to talk about. It's not always an easy subject, but I'm glad we, we were able to do this together. Um, and I just want to remind all our listeners that as you come into this world, you are this rough oyster on the outside. You got some stuff we have to work on. And sometimes opening up the shell is not fun. Sometimes the work brings some tragedy, but no matter what, inside is your pearl. And I hope you go out today and you find your inner pearl of greatness. Have an amazing day. Yeah.